President Mohamed Buhari threatens ultimate destruction of bandits after another mass killing and urges journalists to be watchful of the wordings in their reportage. And the People's Democratic Party Convention will not truncate the tenure of the party's suspended national chairman, Prince Uche Sekundus, says a senior member of the party. Well, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anakom. President Muhammad Buhari has reacted to the latest killings by bandits in the Northwest, threatening the country by the bandits with ultimate destruction. His reaction came a day after armed bandits attacked a market in Goronyo, Sokoto State, killing at least 30 people. The attack is the latest by bandits in Sokoto, one of the states most affected by banditry in Northwest Nigeria. The president also urged the media to address the tone content and standards of reporting into security and safety measures. He asked that, that the term rising in security should be replaced with the reality of declining in security. Well, joining us to discuss this and break down uh, the content of Mr. President's speech is Kwanam Terence, a security expert, and Dr. Mundi Ubani, who is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you. Really. Great. Quantum, you're a security expert, so I'm going to start with you. The president is talking tough yet again uh, in terms of, you know, the bandits, in fact, generally about terrorism and the fact that pe at, at least 40 people were killed uh, in a, a part of the country. And, and this is not to in any way play down on the number of people who have been killed or, you know, in that state. But we've had killings continuously happen across the country and many people, especially in Kaduna State, have been calling on the president uh, to, you know, somewhat do something uh, to ease the, uh, the pain of the people. We also know that Kaduna State has become uh, more, more of a theater uh, for these bandits, uh, even though we also hear that some of these terrorists, uh, especially Boko Haram, are moving now uh, into areas such as those. Um, talking tough is something we've heard before. Is this enough for us to hold on to, or even the people whose, whose family members have been killed as a result of banditry and the terrorism in this country. Is that enough of a, an encouragement or something to hold on to? Yeah, once again, thanks for having me. Uh, it's quite an unfortunate situation that uh, we keep losing our citizens uh, in this uh, kind of situations. But uh, uh, the president's talking tough at the moment is not the solution to the issue. Uh, if you could recall, uh, when these issues were heating up in Zamfara, uh, we have discussed on this program and we have set up some strategies that, except we change the security architecture, uh, where the command of security forces is deployed to the local levels, uh, where these issues are taking place, uh, we keep having this kind of explosion uh, that will take you down to other states. Uh, it has come to happen. And uh, it's for the president to rather talk tough. I think he should rather change his security strategy and architecture so that we can be able to achieve some results. Because if the command keeps coming from the top, it means that the government, uh, the criminals, are going to have more space explode. This explosion today from Zampara has caused uh, the intrusion of Sokoto State. And if we keep playing politics with this and rather talking tough when the damage has been done without actually changing the strategy whereby a local government chairman should also have a command to the security in this uh, location. The governor should have command with security in the state and X, Y, Z. We keep having issues because the divisional police officers that are in those local government where these issues are happening, if you go there, you might discover that they are not properly armed. They are not taking directives from the, uh, the political head there. It has to trickle down from that local level sometimes up to Abuja before they will have to act. And if they are short of ammunition, they will not have 
the channel to get to the top for them to be rearmed and all that. They have, they have to affect also Inter before Inter moves from the local communities up to the top to be classified and taking action. So the whole channel will not work. And today we have an explosion of bandits in Zara that has intruded Sokoto. Tomorrow it might trickle down into another state and on and on and on. So I think the president should not just talk talk. The president should be able to reject his uh, security architecture uh, so that we should stop having security commands right from neighborhoods so that we can be classifying information, uh, intelligence at that level for us to be able to handle some of this situation because it's quite sad uh, that until now we are in this mess having this thing on our hands for so many years and we have not been able to develop a strategy to protect this and every now and then we are here lamenting how we are losing our fellow citizens because we are refusing to take action now. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you mention all of these things again and again. And uh, th what I'm thinking is, what's the challenge? Why is the... Because this is something that not just you, but every security analyst, uh, you know, in, in this country, whether they be on radio or TV, whether they be on uh, a roundtable conversations, this kinds of ideas have been thrown around. So my, my question is, why is it so difficult, or maybe why does it seem like a daunting task for the presidency to make this happen? He's the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. In other words, his word is final. Uh, and we know, just as you explained, how power you know, trickles down in terms of the forces. So what is the challenge? Why is this rocket science? And I always keep asking, how many people have to die for us to be able to at least get it right, even if it be, even if it be a, a tiny little bit? I think we, it's, it's a clear case of political leadership failing us uh, because, uh, like you say, yes, the solution has been there. The ideas have been there in public domain for them to use. Uh, but for them not to be using them, obviously, uh, we have a problem with the political leadership. Either they are politicizing the whole situations and we keep losing our citizens, or they are just looking the other way and trying to uh, make uh, gains out of uh, what has come to face us today. And that is why at every point we keep encouraging Nigerians that they have to stand up and be able to protect themselves. Uh, because we saw this kind of explosion uh, trying to come up in places like Benway. Uh, then we saw how the governor stood up and took side with the citizens of the state uh, to a point he has to have issues with uh, the federal government. But he stood his ground. And today, uh, those bandits that were trying to uh, explode from that album have been wiped out because the government there came out publicly to expose them and then keep insisting that they were there and they were ignoring them. And to a large extent, uh, they have been rooted out of that place and uh, Benue is relatively safe now except with some uh, clashes of Fulani headsmen and XYZ. So I think that the political leadership is a failure in this situation because even if the federal government is, uh, is being expressing some laxity uh, towards the issues on ground in your state. The governor saw stop to die, to be able to stand up and defend their citizens the way Governor Oton did. And I think with that attention, uh, we'll be giving to them and their citizens might be uh, at, the, at the safer side. Uh, because the federal government is completely ignoring the right strategies that will be able to protect this issue. I'll come back to you because there's a lot more questions that are gathering up in my mind as you speak. But let me go to Dr. Bani. Um, Dr. Bani, yesterday um, the information uh, minister was quoted to uh, be giving us uh, a lecture on the di difference between Boko Haram, bandits, and IPOB. And he did lump um, IPOB with um, Boko Haram, saying they have ideologies. Um, and those ideologies are not in the best interest of the entity called Nigeria, but that the bandits do not have a flag. They do not necessarily have an ideology of sorts, and so they cannot all be categorized. I'm asking this question because I want to talk about the issue of nomenclature. How do we deal with insecurity, especially one that's a hydra-headed monster like banditry, or whatever name we want to call it, whether there are known gunmen or faceless gunmen or bandits or headers, killer headers? Um, how do we deal with that situation if the government is trying to tell us what to call it and how to report on it? 
Right. Thank you very much once again for having me. Uh, when a government uh, tries as much as possible to rationalize and call criminals a different name, uh, it will also affect their attitude how to tackle uh, the threat of insecurity and, and the things we've been discussing. I think we are also getting tired of discussing this uh, state of insecurity in Nigeria because uh, virtually every week, every week, you know, one television or the other radio station will assemble experts and they provide all the solutions and, and talk and, and tell us what is actually wrong uh, with our security uh, uh, policing system. And the government do not in any way take any of these uh, uh, suggestions and advice into consideration. You can't expect a different uh, result. You know, it's only a madman that does the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Uh, what we do is to lament or to uh, to uh, threaten or to use flowery language in order to describe what has happened most of the times, you know, without any practical answer to the state of insecurity. You know, just as my uh, brother has said, you know, if your policing system is uh, uh, over centralized, uh, direction and, and directive has to come from Abuja in order to deal with a matter that is purely local. There is no way you will expect an effective uh, uh, policy uh, system. Now, the bandits that came and attacked those people in the market in Sokoto, uh, I understood that there are more than 200. 200 bandits, you know, where were they coming from? Where were there no security, you know, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the road or on the way? Where did they come from? And how did they manage to enter into such an environment, you know, with such a large number of persons that came from wherever they come from and then did what they did and then escaped and nothing happened to them. So what what manner of policing system are we are we using in this country in order to create a state of security? What are we are we really protecting lives and property, which I know is the primary responsibility of government. So the reactionary strategy is not going to give us effective result. There is no intelligence gathering. There is no practical intention on the part of government to actually fight insecurity, especially when a top government like the Minister of Communication or Minister of Information is telling you that those who are bandits are so much lovers of Nigeria, they are very patriotic, that the only people that are not patriotic are the IPOP and those who are agitating for uh, for self-governance, you know, so those are people that should be considered an enemy and dealt with, whereas those who are bandits and who are terrorists are very patriotic and they love Nigeria so much. And if a government official is doing that by way of rationalization, so do you expect that same government to now probably, you know, regard them as enemies who should be dealt with? But and, Barista, and this, this government well. campaigned over and over again. In fact, this is one of the reasons why they, many Nigerians voted them into office. One of their cardinal points was that they were going to fight and put an end to insecurity in the country. Uh, we're almost six years into this administration, and we have not necessarily been able to say that that has been done. So really, we expect them to, whether they show us via, via their body language or not. This is an expectation because they built up that expectation when they were campaigning for our votes. Yeah, but they have shown you that they don't have the capacity uh, to deal with those promises they made. They made, they made so many promises. Is it on the economic sphere? Is it on the issue of fighting corruption or insecurity? They made so many promises. But you and I know today that those promises, they have not been able to, uh, to meet with it. They have not in any way fulfilled those promises, and they know it. But my only problem and my own worry is that the same government that knows that they have failed in keeping to those promises they made. We come and on the, our face and throw it on our face and tell you that they are the best government that Nigeria has ever had from 1960s till death, that they have done more than any other government. And I tell you, what have you done? What, in what area can you really sell you, you tell Nigeria that you have excelled? Is it the time in the issue of uh, fighting insecurity? Which area, which area today, which region in Nigeria today is clearly safe? Where can you go to your bed, you know, with your two eyes closed in this country today and say, I am safe because of the fact that the government is one, if not for God himself, who has been so magnanimous in protecting us. The government has failed in this issue of fighting insecurity. They have not succeeded in, in really keeping Nigeria safe. In fact, we have deteriorated. 
to the extent that today, virtually all the regions, the Northwest used to be safe. Sokoto, you know, is in is in Northwest. But you can see what happened in Sokoto, where are many, and then now you are deploying uh, the military. So why were the military not deployed in the first place? You know, to ensure that there is maximum security. Not fully whether Zamfara, you know, is very close to Sokoto. Whatever is happening for in Zamfara, we can can spread to Sokoto easily. That there should be enough security in all those borderlines. So, but nothing is being done until so reactionary strategy cannot give us, you know, absolute security. And as some people have said. Let's, let's go to the issue of uh, decentralization of the policing system. We need state policing. It should be local because security is local. Let people who are in the let's begin to man their own local government. If every local government chairman mans his local government, everyone mans his local government, mans his area, mans his world. I can assure you that Nigeria becomes safe. But this issue of waiting for Abuja to give directive what will happen in a remote village. But, you know, but, but we also <laughs> cannot wait. We still have to rely on Abuja, in, in your own words, because, you know, I, I do not know if the Police Act has room for that. You're a lawyer, so maybe you'd educate us. There has to be room in the Constitution to accommodate state policing, doesn't it? Yes, well, we, they, 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 there is a process that is ongoing uh, on the amendment of the Constitution. And one of the suggestions that have been made by experts is that we should go for state policy, including the governors that were initially very selfish and not agreeing. They have come to realize that there is no way we can effectively police this country without state policy. And they have all agreed. So that amendment is something that is ongoing. And people are deeply in the conversation. We have seen what happened in other nations that are federal, you know, republic and what they do in terms of security. They say that even their university has their own policing system. Mm -hmm. Local government has their decent policing system. So why is it in a big country like this, you know, country like Nigeria, you want every directive to come from Abuja with regards to things that happen in remote places all over the country? It cannot in any way work that way. And that's why we're saying that the government must take everything and look at it deeply in order for the sake of this country to actually change the, uh, you know, policing architecture. That is the only way we can get ourselves effectively policed. And, and I think the ongoing conversation with the issue of amendment of the constitution is uh, in that regard. Okay, let me come back to you, Kwanam, because um, issues of security can be very sensitive, and of course, um, as journalists, we're trained on how to report them. But then the presidency is speaking about um, journalists using certain terms and not using the other. But as an English student, I'm looking at both statements um, that the president has made, and, uh, and he's saying that we should use one for the other. One means that, well... They're gradually winning the war, but the other is saying, well, we're experiencing some form of insecurity. So I'm trying to understand how one replaces the other, but maybe you could help us understand how we should, what we should say and what we shouldn't say in terms of reporting. I think in the first place, they are trying to cover their failure and not how the reporting should be, because uh, what is happening in the Northwest and the Middle West of this country uh, it's not attacks by bandits, by terrorists. But they have always changed the narrative uh, to make everybody believe that they are bandits. And, they, and uh, the, the press has already joined them to be calling uh, terrorists in this country bandits. So uh, maybe because the collusion and that is happening between the press and them is failing, and that is why uh, he's cautioning the press. If not, we have been encumbered by terrorists in this country. And the government is rather covering uh, terrorism in this country so that they will not have uh, international interventions uh, to help assist them uh, end this crisis. And that is why uh, they keep looking for one excuse or the other uh, to take the international community attention away from what is happening in this country. But it's quite unfortunate that we have a government uh, in this country that uh, have been encumbered by terrorists and rather and uh, look for assistance and way to flush them out of their uh, boundaries. They are looking for ways to protect them and give them uh, the legal backing uh, to keep oppressing their citizens. And mm -hmm. so I expect that journalists should be professional uh, in handling issues that have to do with security in this country because no one is safe at the end of the day uh, because uh, they have started even killing uh, the people, in quotes, the high places that we felt were safe. Uh, the issue that is happening in this country is what the federal government, if they were serious, they could have handled. Uh, we have said it time without number. 
and that the tourists that were moving from the northeast to the northwest were going to have more live spaces to print the ball. We have more on government spaces in the northwest than the northeast that they were operating. Wow. And if we allow them to occupy our government spaces in the northwest, it's going to be a huge challenge for the government to handle without the use of technology and with the intervention of the international community. But rather than admit what is happening to us as a people, the federal government has been deploying every tactics to cover it up to the point of really trying to dictate to the press uh, what they are going to tell our citizens. But I think uh, as citizens, we need to sit up and also seek for help ourselves because we are the ones that are this, and we need the attention of the international community immediately to be able to resolve this issue because every now and then on the daily basis, as we are speaking now, it is possible there might have been an attack somewhere. Mm. They, they have even started deploying the strategy of covering up certain attacks that are not in public domain so that these issues will not be reported. So what is happening, the statement from the president is quite unfortunate, and I don't think any press person should take that seriously. I'm, 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 I like to balance the equation because there are people who have a school of thought that the media can also um, over-report, you know, issues pertaining to terrorists. And this is what they want because they want to continuously um, be in the news and be uh, on the lips of people. That way maybe they spread fear or, um, you know, gain some form of prominence. I mean, before... Before we, before we started talking about Boko Haram, they were just a, a sleeper cell that were not so known. So maybe, I mean, could it be said that maybe the media has also played a role in making these people relevant? Uh, again, if we do not in any way name them and we just report it uh, as, let's say, a known gunman or just say terrorist, whatever nomenclature we decide to change it to, or we refuse to put up the numbers and reduce the sensationalism, or maybe just say people were killed and not give numbers, will that in any way help in the fight against insecurity? And this is the crux of the matter for me. If we were to do what the government is saying, or what the people who oppose what the media is doing uh, are saying, will that in any way change the situation of things? Will it give government the upper hand, or will we just be playing a fool? Well, first off, we are under-reporting the killings in this country because Are we? even the journalists themselves, how, what capacity do they even have to even go to some of these places that these killings are taking place? I have done assessment in the Northeast and part of the Northwest, and I know that there are most of the territories that these people have occupied. You and I cannot even have access to them. Not every security person can even have access. They are taking over our government spaces. They have taken over communities in this country. They are killing people on a daily basis. And you cannot even assess those places to even know how many people have been killed and what kind of damage has been done. Even the, government, the state governments in those places have concluded that those places are out of their control. We are not aware. Sometimes when you run into those kind of situations, you, you become so amazed of the damage that has happened to this country. So already we are underreporting this crisis, and I think what the federal government should have been doing was to try to collaborate with the international community to stop it immediately. Because if we look at the standards that we used to call in, 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 in Borodo State in the Boko Haram days, it's, it, it's something that starts from Drilingua through Zamfara up to the Niger border. So the the the, the standards of oil that have been tied down in the northwest has never ever been reported by the press. The district why in the Sambisa forest of the Dreamingwaris, of the Zamfara, of the Sokotos, and up to uh, Jibia at the borders of Nigeria. Have you people ever reported that all these territories are occupied by the so-called bandits in this country? So there is rather an underreporting of this crisis in this country. So I feel that what the federal government should be doing is to look at strategies that will end this crime and not dictate to people how to report and make sure because the damage has already been done. Okay. Finally, Dr. Bani, um, still, still staying with, you know, the issue of reportage, uh, which uh, is uh, the crux for the presidency um, and, of course, um, those who work for him. Um, we also know that... And, this year has been a very interesting year for the media, by the way, in Nigeria. We've had all kinds of bills come back and go 
Um, we've, we've had the NBC tell us uh, how to report on this particular issue. The NBC being the Broadcasting uh, Commission, which is in charge of regulating media houses, told us also uh, how to report on these issues. Um, and it didn't really go down well with you know, people in the country, aside from the media. Um, we've also seen people, stations being clamped down on, and sometimes journalists, we saw the very, the most recent was the, the uh, um, I think it was Channel Television and some of their reporters. Uh, so really, where, where is the insurance, the cover, the, um, the umbrella of the Constitution in terms of, you know, where the journalist is safe when it comes to reporting? And... As much as the, we, the reporter wants to put out news and put out information, gets facts and put it out there, how do you deal with also not being um, victimized by the powers that be? Apart from the other three major arms of government, and I'm talking about the executive, uh, the judiciary, and the legislative, uh, our 1999 constitution under fundamental objective and directive principle of state uh, on set certain section of that uh, particular ch chapter two, uh, gave a very grave responsibility to the Nigerian press in order to hold government accountable and make sure that government uh, is clearly, clearly under watch and then information of what goes in governance being uh, made known to the people. So they are uh, under premise, under the constitution, uh, to be under obligation to do that. And then under the uh, fundamental rights uh, provision, which is in chapter four, issue of freedom of expression is there and is guaranteed by the constitution. And so the press has a constitutional responsibility uh, in informing and also in holding government accountable. And so no matter whatever government want to do in terms of clamping down on free expression, they are just wasting their time. It's a constitutional responsibility uh, for which the press uh, must at every point in time be ready and alert in order to fight. And then with the, with the combined position of the civil society, uh, government must always be put on notice that they have no right whatsoever to clamp down on free expression. Free expression of the people is a guaranteed right. And the Nigerian press is under the obligation to hold them accountable. Now, let me say, when there is failure in governance, when they have failed in leadership, they don't want people to know about this failure. And the next thing they will do is to clamp down and, and to ensure that you do not have that freedom to report. And when you do, they impose all manner of penalty, including fine, which is what is going on presently. And of course, there are some of the bills that are pending for which uh, stakeholders are clearly opposed and they are still helping on, on you know, trying to uh, uh, you know, tackle the people and tell them that they have no right. Remember that they banned uh, Twitter? I am in court presently over that Twitter ban and many people, including Nigerian Bar Association, uh, they are also in court and so many other Nigerians and NGOs are in court over this short Twitter ban and they have even threatened to ban more other social platforms you know, in Nigeria because according to them they spread fake news. I see no reason why the government should not be tolerant of opposing views. I see no reason why government should not be interested in getting a feedback you know, uh, uh, system from the people that they have that have elected them because feedback mechanism is clearly inherent in democracy. You need to hear from the people how they are feeling with your type of uh, you know, style of governance. If you are not doing well, they will tell you. If you are doing well, they will also appraise you and say that you are doing very well. And so this issue of being highly intolerant is something that has actually given this government uh, uh, part of the minuses, you know, that we, we talk about uh, Buhari's government. You know, so they have done it over years now. In fact, it's reported that from 2015 today that Nigeria is clearly not under, under democracy in terms of freedom of expression, that they have clamped down severely on media houses who freely express and inform Nigerians of what is going on in governance. And it's not a good thing uh, because the world has become a good privilege. So people are knowing what is going on here is not right. Yeah, so, so no, I think knowing, I Dr. 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 Bani, knowing is not enough. Because I asked that question deliberately. Who protects the journalist? The journalist, that, yes, is the only profession in the Constitution that's been given a responsibility uh, to be the fourth estate of the realm. But... Where is the cover for the journalist? Where is the protection for the journalist? We even see media houses that employ these journalists, throw them under the bus when, you know, uh, push comes to shove. So really, where is the encouragement to really be a journalist and, and be unbiased? 
Well, I don't think that you, the, the journalists have been left alone in this fight. Uh, the NGOs and some of the civil society groups have been always uh, on the side of uh, the basic responsibility that the constitution has assigned to the to the that, that profession, and of course, judiciary be you know is final bore you know against any oppressive uh, pronouncement of any government. So the judiciary is always there. If anyone feels threatened at any point in time uh, about this uh, issue of clamp down on on free expression, the courts will become the last resort. You go there, the court will be able to protect, and the courts have been living up the expectation. As I said earlier, on the issue of uh, Twitter, we're in court, and I believe that you know before the end of this year, we should be able to know where we are with regards to that particular. The government is, okay. uh, is also feeling the heat. They're okay. making arrangements now to leave the ban on, on Twitter and all that. So what I think we should do, that there must be a combined effort in order to let the government know that they cannot keep free expression. They cannot keep key free speech in the country. And that can be done by the populace resisting any such autocratic or draconian policies of government, especially against free speech. That is, that's what I think. And then the judiciary is there for you. That's what I can assure you. Well, I want to say thank you, Dr. Um, Monde Ubani, and of course, Terence Kwanam. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We appreciate it. That's a pleasure. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we will discuss the possibility of the PDP convention negatively ending the tenure of its embattled chairman, although he seems to think different. Stay with us.